It's really cool though because it's like although we're limited to the amount of people we can have present physically, so many people tune in online. Yeah, they're good. I noticed that some are paid, some are free. Watching online and joining us in person. I am your host, Samuel Locher, and welcome to our next installment in our Jada Talk speaker series for Miami Art Week 2020. Today, right now, we are going to be discussing the courage to create in the world of media. With so much of the art world being reduced to commercial viability and branding, it takes courage to create artwork with depth and meaning 
especially for the artists looking to live off of their art. Unfortunately, we live in a world of logos and many people would prefer to buy the easily identifiable artwork uh, equivalent to a Louis Vuitton handbag over conceptually driven artwork. Contemporary artists must choose what direction they take their practice in while also taking into consideration how they will pay their bills at the end of the month. Today I am joined by Edward Cornejo, an associate dean with Broward College's Department of Arts, Communication, Humanities, and Design. He has over 30 years of educational experience and possesses degrees in psychology, counseling, and history. His area of expertise lies in the history of Latin America and in the social history of medicine with special emphasis on the 20th century plague pandemic and, most recently, medical mistrust among immigrant and African American communities. He has been honored by the president of the Borough of Queens, granted several travel awards, and through the SunTrust Foundation, has been the recipient of an endowed teaching award. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dean Cornejo. Thank you, Sam. Thank so, you for having me here. So tell me a little bit more about this title, the, the Courage to Create in a World of Mediocrity. You came up with it yourself. <clears throat> well, The Courage to Create is based off of a book that I had read very many years ago by Rollo May. He's a, he's a British existentialist uh, psychologist who wrote a book called The Courage to Create. And he focuses on how the human being relies on the connections between himself and everything around him, right? And one of the things that has always sparked interest in me regarding that book is the fact that so many people in what we now call like a microwave society, that consumer society that, that you were talking about, right. are so afraid to create, right? to, to become their authentic selves, to be transparent in terms of, of looking at the beauty and the connections in, in everything, right? And as a teacher for 32 years, one of the things I've noticed in my students, as well as some of my adult students, is this fear to just let go and to create. Right? Yeah. This fear that if I don't do what mommy and daddy told me to do, if I don't do the accounting, if I don't do the medicine, etc., that I'm going to live a life that my parents don't want or that I don't want, etc. And yet, that holds us back when we think that way. And I've always taken it as my motto that you have to, in order to create, you have to have a certain courage, a certain coraje, like we say in Spanish, yeah. to really grab that connection by the horns and do something with it so that our true selves come out, so that we are forming relationships. Like in our last talk, we talked a little bit about that interconnection between people and, and the importance of that. And I think that takes courage, especially in, in, the, in 2020, when now we're surrounded with a pandemic, we're surrounded by social media, and we live in a really weird time in history when we're both connected and very much separated from the other person. We know everything that you're doing, I know what you're eating, I know what you're, you're wearing, etc., but I don't know you. And I think that's a big conflict, and I think it keeps people from being creative, from being courageous enough to express. Yeah. One thing my parents always instilled in me my entire life was some people live their entire lives, live to be 103, like we were talking about someone's grandma a little earlier today, uh, worrying their whole lives about what other people think about themselves, mm -hmm. or, or think about them, rather. And it's, it's, it's a waste of time, because you're only living life for yourself at the end of the day. No, no one else gets to be you. Mm -hmm. And one interesting phenomenon I've observed since the pandemic has happened is all of a sudden I think a lot of people feel a lot more in touch with their own mortality. And this has galvanized people to really dive into these passion projects mm -hmm. that they were you know, otherwise going to just leave in the background. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if maybe it's a symptom of them having more time on their hands and only that. or I mean, in my opinion, I think it's because they're a little more in touch with their own mortality. I think that's very much connected to it, and I think that like the younger generation, the Gen, Gen Zers, you know, the, the ones that are just coming into college now, 
what makes them so amazing is that they don't have any of those drawbacks that we had when we, my generation grew up and, and we worried so much about how I'm going to fit in. Mm -hmm. And what I'm finding in my students is they don't necessarily always want to fit in. If it means having, not, not being able to express who they are, how they are, whether it's through clothing, through art, through their expression of gender, through their expression of, of their writing even. And, and I think that's a beautiful thing because if there's going to be art during this pandemic, it's going to come from those people who don't have those drawbacks, right? And don't yeah. have that need to feel like they have to fit in and, and fit a, uh, a particular mold. Right, right. I think another part of that is as well, I mean, prior to the age of the internet, the physical community you had around you was the only community. And so right. if you're going to do something that would, uh, you know, cast you as different within that community, then all of a sudden you might have lost your community. But now, you know, if you're the only person in some little town in Minnesota or, and that has this interest in whatever niche topic, well, that's okay. You can find tons of friends on the internet all around the world that become your community then, in right. place of what you physically have around you. Perhaps that's why you're seeing this difference. In right, but then, but then the question becomes, you know, how does that contribute to that need to create? Right? Yeah. And you can't create if you don't have a connection to the physical world outside of you. You know, it's like I'm, I'm sitting in a room surrounded by art, and we know that the connection starts with you know with that canvas and with that painting etc and what you do with it yeah. is what's going to to create the art yeah. and, but it's that it's that moment in that connection that becomes really really important have you ever heard of the book the war of art the war of art mm -hmm. yes yes yeah not the art of war by Sun Tzu but the, the war of art <clears throat> And I forget the name of the author, it escapes me, Jonah talks you on your head, maybe you know it. Um, and it's all about kind of the internal struggle a, a creator faces, whether you're an artist making paintings or someone who wants to write something. Um, just kind of this internal battle you face trying to overcome your own inhibitions to, you know, finally to put pen to pad or paintbrush to canvas to then create and a, a lot of those inhibitions might be like what you're touching on now with you know, people are worried about what other people might think of it. A lot of people are worrying about trying something and not being good at it right, right off the bat, which is ridiculous because most things you try for the first time you're not gonna be good at. <laughs> yeah, so the, people need to find ways to get Well that around. kept me from practicing art of any sort for a really long time simply because the Stephen Pressfield is the Stephen author. Stephen Pressfield? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but even that, that, that kept me from even trying a class in drawing, for example. I was so yeah. afraid of the critique and being and not being good at it yeah. that I never even bothered to learn. You know, and my education was completely academic and I'm grateful for it. But how great it would have been to just add, you know, the drawing classes or the painting, etc. I keep saying, keep telling Jonathan I'm going to take one of his classes one day, you as should. long as he doesn't critique me. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the most valuable part of the class. Yeah. I mean, the one thing about but it, it is, is, but it, but it is, a certain level of fear and that courage comes from accepting it. Say, you know what? I'm doing this despite that fear. I'm doing it. Nobody's born courageous, right? Yeah. Right. You're not. You don't become courageous. You don't become creative simply because you want to make the world a better place. You make the better place because of the world you see, the world, the world that you're connected to, the world that you are living in. You, know, you respond to it, you react. Right. And something else too, if you're going to try something for the first time, whether it be drawing or sculpting, probably won't be good at it right off the bat. You may never be good at it. Mm -hmm. But if you enjoy doing something, Shouldn't that be enough? Uh, Even if no one else enjoys what you're doing? Okay. Uh, usually my Saturdays I'm spending nowadays doing ceramics. I don't think I'm good at it. 
I have created a couple of bowls or maybe a, a vase or two. Yeah. But, but to create beautiful things, I mean, that takes years of practice. But but it's a good workout. It's a good experience. It's a good way of my venting whatever stresses I've had during the week. And it's it's creative, right? I'll just sit there and like I have no idea what this is supposed to be and eventually I just start fiddling with it and it becomes a flower vase or it becomes a, a, a plate for my granola or whatever ashtrays has this been since the pandemic that you started dabbling in ceramics um, no I, I took a couple of classes about a year and a half ago with one of our professors at Broward College and then now, since I have a little bit of free time on weekends, and I'll hit the studio and, and I'll go and, and I'll just practice a little bit. And it's a very safe environment. There, there's nobody there really, and so I get to I get to play with I get to play with clay. I get to play with mud, basically. Yeah. It's good to have something to do with your hands too. I mean, it's good yes, for your mind, whether it's exercising, drawing, just going on walks, even mm-hmm. just quieting your mind a little bit allowing yourself to get back in touch with the physical world and take right. your mind off of what it is that you have to do to pay your bills, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And that words to create the world of mediocrity. But then what is the world of mediocrity? I think the world of mediocrity is what we're seeing today, that idea of being content with what I have right now, just like everybody else, rather than surpassing whatever limitations I have, whatever challenges I've met, etc. And I've been struggling with, with that concept because I try to teach my students as well as um, my faculty that mediocrity is not an option. Nobody hires mediocrity. Nobody wants to be mediocre, which is just simply average, right? Yeah. But in order to surpass that, to overcome that, you have to be creative. And, and that creativity starts with who you are as a person. How do you express yourself into the world, with the world, and among other people in the world, right? And that mediocrity gets gets broken right there, being that connection that you're making to the outside world, right? Yeah. And so when I mean when I say mediocrity, what I mean is that microwave consumer, fast paced, don't have to work for it, don't want to work for it kind of life that I should get simply because I am. Yes. And, and you know, I'm looking around the room and you can all say mediocrity has never, ever succeeded. You know? yeah. And yet, why would we accept that? And so, in a world that's constantly pushing us to copy the Kardashians, to copy Beyonce, to to worry about their stories and about their babies and about all of this other stuff, my constant question is, well, at what point do you start creating your own story? At what point do you start writing your own story? story? And you know, a lot of people, they might want to buy the the products of Kardashian or Beyonce and use this, but copying them would almost be too bold for some people. A lot of people put these these icons we have in our society up on this unobtainable pedestal, right? Mm-hmm. People trap themselves in these imaginary boxes of what their own limitations are, you know? 20 years ago, Kim Kardashian was just a valley girl in California, you know? She, she, she wasn't letting uh, these imaginary boxes But I think it's because of that fear to be oneself. Yeah, that we get so caught up in their lives, right? So uh, I'll give you a really short example. I have a friend who a few years ago uh, was over at the house and, and kind of discussed the birth of Blue Ivy and this of Blue Ivy and the fact that Jay Z and Beyonce had Blue Ivy. <laughs> that, that's, I think that's the kid's name, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. the first one. Blue Ivy. And and at, at one point I'm saying, like, you know, at what? Okay, why are you so concerned about this? Oh, because she's so beautiful. Is that what Okay, were you invited to the christening? Were you invited <laughs> to the party? Were you invited to this? No, of course I don't know them. <laughs> so then, why do you care? You missed right? your own niece's birthday party exactly. last week. At what point? 
tell me about Blue Ivy. Right. So, and my question was, at what point do you start making your own story rather than being so focused and so entrenched in the story of other people? Yeah. Right? They don't live your life. Yeah. You know, you're going to be on this planet for 80, 90 years. And Beyonce and, and what's his face? Jay-Z are not the ones who are going to be able to express your life for you. That's you. Yeah. And I don't know if the message hit home, yeah. you know, but, but I think that that's what it boils down to. We're so caught up in, in other people's lives and other people's creations that we forget that we too are creative beings yeah. that need to be and that connect with the world through our words, through our actions, through our painting, through our playing with dirt and, and mud. And I think a lot of times this, you know, consumerist, my growth society, as you said, um, kind of molds people's minds, in a sense, to this icon worship, celebrity worship that we have, where the most they'll ever aspire to, or dream to aspire to, is, is not what these people, like a Jay-Z or Beyonce, have accomplished for themselves, but instead they lust after their material possessions whether it's the fancy necklace, the house, but never anything what they actually built for themselves professionally through their creative endeavors, through their business ventures. And that's why it takes courage to decide you want something bigger than the life working whatever job it is that you're unsatisfied with. And maybe what you really aspire to, what might bring you fulfillment, isn't necessarily gonna buy you a mansion in Calabasas, California, right. but it might get you something a lot more valuable, mm -hmm. which is a content life, a happiness for yourself at the end right. of the day. And, and, then, and we all define that very differently, right? Yeah. We all define that in very different ways, in different manners, and I, I would agree, right? But when you're caught up in this microwave society of consumerism and celebrity worship, you don't ever, if you're more concerned with Blue Ivy than your own like niece mm -hmm. or cousin, you're probably really out of touch with what that means for you, mm -hmm. with what that means for you. You're just caught up in this material world of these celebrity icons and I think it kind of divorces you a little bit from your own reality because at the end of the day, someone like the Kardashian is watching that, enjoying their what they put out, it's escapism. Oh, absolutely. It is, it's escapism. And so the more you're, you're divorced from your own reality, the further away you are from what's going to make your life for you, whatever that means to the individual. It's funny because with my students especially, they're so afraid of falling in love with a discipline that they think may not bring them money, right? Or may not bring them the career that they want. And and I spend a significant amount of time teaching them to just kind of let go. You can balance. You can balance falling in love with sociology, history, art, appreciation, art history, with what you're doing, but it has to be balanced. And that fear, I think, that fear that I can't do this, I can't love, I can't love this because it's not going to give me a career, is what's really keeping most of my students back from being good readers, being good thinkers, being good good artists yeah. by the widest and the most ample definition of that term. And the fear is real. I mean, I, 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 I see it in their faces. Like, I'm not allowed to love this. I'm not allowed to like this. And that's where the beauty of education comes in. It's like when they realize that they can fit what they're learning in class, what they're learning in, in, in art appreciation and history into their entire chosen profession, yeah. it changes things. Right? It changes the way they perceive it. It changes the way they deal with other people. It changes the way they connect to the world. Yeah. And in my experience as a student, when I was one, um, a lot of people I think would get too caught up in thinking that getting a certain degree would confine, confine them to a certain uh, career path. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's definitely the case if you're going to go to med school. Right. Law school, even I think there's a little more wiggle room in law school, mm -hmm. but um, you know, a com a communications major could easily get the same job that an English major sure, could get. Translate that into 
Yeah, and then you could you could specialize in one area of interest that really interests you in, in, in a college, and I don't think it's really going to shoot you in the foot uh, when it, when it comes time to get a job. Mm -hmm. Because also, they're they're, they're going to be way more concerned with your work experience than what you major. Oh, absolutely. I think one of the first things I tell my students at the beginning of the year is, you know, the days when you were in high school and you were, you were told go discover what you like and what you're good at. Those days are over. In college, that's the opportunity for you to create yourself, right? You're creating your resume, you're creating your profession. But most importantly, you're, cre you're creating the reputation you want for yourself and the life you want 20, 30, 50 years down the line. Yeah. You know, and that starts now. And yet, when I say that, they look at me like they've never heard this before. Yeah, Probably it, it's about creating. We have to create ourselves. It's not about discovering anymore. Okay. You know, so. I met so many people that are either, you know, during their course of time in college, they'll be so concerned with picking like the right STEM major mm -hmm. because that's what's going to guarantee them a job in their minds. And they're very studious. They're always on top of all their assignments and everything. They never join a club mm -hmm. at college. They can't connect to people. Okay. But and that's the thing, a club is probably going to help you get a job more than any degree, right? I mean, depending on the club, of course, but, you know, you got to meet these people, you got to broaden your horizons, and you can broaden your horizons through a class, but you also have to broaden your horizons. If you're trying to get a job, you have to broaden your horizons locally with your yeah, local network. And I think, and I think that's, you just hit the nail on the head with the way Rollo Way and existentialism looks at this, is that like you have to look at the whole person. It cannot just be one-sided or or just like a doctor or a lawyer or even a teacher. It's, you are an entire person that's connected in the world, that's living in the world, that's making a difference in the world. And that's how we approach it. Right? You know, that's how I think education should be approached. I think that's why art is important as we look around. We, art makes a difference. You know? yeah. And that difference is going to be different for you than it is for me. Yeah. I see things differently. Let me ask you a question, I know this is a little off topic, but as an educator, where do you see the traditional, how do you see it, the traditional degree path changing in the next decade in the United States? I think a lot of people are asking them, themselves this question more so now than ever. Mm -hmm. People who would be gearing up for their first semester of college this year don't even want to go at this point because they're not getting that in-person college experience. I know if I was a student about to go to college, I'd be like, I'm taking a gap year or however long it takes right. for this pandemic to be over because I don't like learning online. Are I you don't speaking know. specifically now or are you yeah. speaking in general? In general, I mean, yeah. going for because I think, you know, even if someone waves a magic wand and the pandemic's over tomorrow, gotcha. okay. I kind of see like there's, there's a, a crack in the glass. There's an amazing book, and I think you and I discussed the um, book Homo Deus by Noah Harari, the author of Sapiens. Okay. And in that book, he asks a very simple question, and that is, what is it that we have to teach the students of the 21st century? And he asks that question because for the first time in human history and in educational history, we actually, as professors, as high school teachers, as primary and grammar school teachers, we really don't know what to teach students for what they're going to do in 20, 30, 40 years, yeah. because everything they need is on their cell phones. And it's and changing, and it's so, changing so dynamic, right? And so what he's saying, and I love the way he put it, it's like, the disciplines of the future are going to be those that can incorporate technical skill, etc., with the empathetic skills. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's the empathy, it's the empathetic nature of nursing, of teaching, of caring for other people, of the creation of art, of, of just being in contact with other people that's going to that, that's going to make us competitive, for lack of a better word. Well, and I mean, they're the only kinds of things that will be machine-proof. Right? Yeah. <laughs> he was just talking about how, there's a chapter in the book where he talks about how there are already computer programs that can create accounting computer programs, right? And that a computer is 95, 96% more accurate in terms of diagnosis than a doctor. Yeah. Doctor, you know, so, but the nurse, 
nurse will always be there to hold your hand. The nurse will be there for you to vent. The nurse will be there for that final hug, that final yeah. goodbye, etc. The computer can't. You know, and it, it'd be interesting to see what happens over the next 30, 40 years. Yeah, I, I think another big reservation too, a lot of students here in the United States especially have, is they see so many people who were told their whole lives that if they go to college, if they get this degree, they take out these student loans, it'll be worthwhile. It'll be worthwhile. They'll get a good paying job, mm-hmm. they major in STEM, whatever. Um, but their lived experience is they see all of these people coming out of the uh, higher education system shackled with tens of thousands, in some cases hundreds of thousands mm-hmm. of student debt to the point where they can't even afford to lease a car or right. rent an apartment because they have this massive pile of debt over their heads. And I'm very against this idea that student, 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds should sign up for all this debt. I think it's like modern-day admission servitude, to be honest. Oh, absolutely. I think one of the yeah. most amazing things that the school where I work, private college, does is we tell students that student debt is not the way to go. Yeah. Because student debt goes with you to the grave until it's paid off. But I also acknowledge the fact that you know college and and those courses that you take, regardless of your major, yeah. it's about building your resume. It's about building who you are. Yeah. You you are a communications major, but that can be translated into any possible field. Just like yeah. philosophy majors, history majors, English majors, right? Yeah. But what you do with those skills, because nobody's going to ask you, you know, whether or not you did well in. SPC 1608, or whether or not you can tell me everything you, there is to know about Shakespeare or about about the Franco-Prussian War, but how you analyze things, right? Yeah. How you analyze ideas, how you express those ideas, are what's much more important. And I tell my students, the resume and your transcript is your opportunity to create the image you want for the world to see. Yeah, and you know something. This might sound terrible, but as someone who's had to go through resumes myself before and decide who's going to be the best person for whatever the job was, unless this person really is just very young and we're looking for like an intern, right. if I see someone putting their grade point average from 10 years ago from mm-hmm. their bachelor's degree, I don't think they're going to be a good fit for anything I'd want them yeah, to do. You have to learn how to read between the lines, and I yeah. think that's what people don't realize that when you're applying for jobs, the people looking at the resumes are not looking at the actual writing. It's they're actually reading between the lines there. They're seeing what you got involved in, what your people skills are, etc. And at BC, what we tell our students is that the number one thing that employers are looking for is not the knowledge, because that can be taught. Yeah. Not the skill, because that can be taught. Obviously, nursing is a different story. Yeah. But social skills, yeah. you know, soft skills, the idea. Can you have a conversation? Can you sell the product through conversation yeah. rather than through Instagram or whatever? Yeah. And it is interesting because there is a fine line you have to walk because as much as as important as these soft skills are that we've been talking about, these kind of machine proof mm-hmm. skills, before any person and especially for larger corporations, before any person looks at your resume. Some AI software is going to look at it and scan it before yeah, any absolutely. human eyeballs go on it. So you have to be able to actually kind of walk the line where yeah. you know how to give the machine what it wants. And that's been happening for about decades now. I remember what was yeah. it, Monster.com or something yeah. back in the 90s. Still around. And, and yeah. that's, is it, is it yeah. Yeah, <laughs> just supposed to show up? Yeah. Well, Dean Cornet, well, it's a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much like for this like insightful like conversation. Being here. It was really great having you once again. Thank you everyone online and in person for tuning in. Be sure to go to jadaartfair.com to check out the rest of our programming for the weekend. We hope to see you guys soon. Everyone have a nice evening. Take care. Have a good weekend.